the the question for this week is, you know, how can a good God allow suffering? And um, and it's obviously one of those questions that uh, that's really common, right? Because it's uh, because it really is a hard question to answer, uh, you know, and um, and to you know, to feel it's a hard question to feel satisfied with the answer sometimes uh, when you have a really strong faith, right? And so, um, and so, uh, for someone who uh, who maybe doesn't have faith in in God at all, and they're trying to understand that, uh, it can be a really hard thing to under uh, you know to understand and to uh, and to sort of connect. Um, you know, how can you have this good God that's all powerful, uh, and, uh, and and yet He allows suffering? Uh, he doesn't stop our suffering sometimes, right? And um, uh, and yet, you know, the Bible doesn't leave us without uh, without answers for this uh, for this question, which I think is really uh, uh, really uh, really helpful. Um, I'm going to go through. I'm going to take a few uh, more minutes longer than usual uh, for uh, resources and just recommend a bunch of books. Um, you know, I, uh, there's two. I, I think there's two sort of groups of books that are really helpful when you're thinking about suffering and that sort of thing. There are, there's the books that talk uh, about suffering and that help us understand, uh, you know, sort of a, a theology of, of suffering and, and what the Bible has to teach us on that. And then there are books uh, by people who are suffering and who, and who have suffered and, and to hear, uh, you know, and to hear from them and sort of an, an understanding of, uh, you know, how, how God has walked with them through suffering. And I think both sides of that are really, uh, are, are really important and really, and really helpful for us, you know, to, um, to know what sort of God says about it. And then to, um, uh, to hear how other people have experienced that and experienced God in the midst of, uh, in the midst of suffering. Um, so there's a couple of, uh, uh, of books you know, with that second category of um, people who uh, uh, who have suffered, who are suffering, um, uh, this is the one. This is one that uh, Doug mentioned this morning in the uh, in the sermon when God weeps uh, by Johnny Erickson Tata, uh, which is uh, which is a really a really good uh, good book on um, on hearing you know her suffering uh, you know as a um, uh, as a paraplegic like like he said I mean now for fifty years but. Uh, uh, but to hear sort of how what God has taught her through uh, through that, um, uh, C.S. Lewis is a grief observed uh, as he uh, this is um, when he talks about uh, just him walking through uh, the death of his wife uh, to cancer, I believe, and, um, uh, and and you know he didn't uh, he didn't meet her and and marry her until sort of later on in life, and uh, and and then you know to have her. Uh, have her get sick and die relatively quickly after they were married, um, uh, and so that's a lot of her, a lot of his thoughts on you know watching her suffer and uh, and eventually pass away. Um, uh, this is uh, um, a book, uh, "When God Doesn't Fix It" by Laura Story. Uh, she's um, uh, she helps lead worship at Perimeter Church, which is a PCA church uh, in uh, in Atlanta, and uh, and her husband has uh, a uh, uh, it's some sort of, uh, brain, um, uh, sickness in his brain that he got at some point. And, uh, and so it's this chronic thing that they have dealt with their whole lives. And, you know, and so like that title says, you know, she talks a lot about, you know, that it's one thing to sort of be going through suffering and to pray and God takes it away. Right. But that's not always, that's not always what happens. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, she talks a lot about, what it's been like to, uh, you know, to pray for so long and for God to not take, uh, it, you know, um, this away from her husband and sort of how, uh, and how they've been able to walk, walk through that and, uh, and learn, you know, even in their learning how to pray, you know, when you feel like you're praying for this thing over and over again, and it doesn't, uh, and it doesn't seem to, uh, uh, to, um, to happen. And then, uh, and then this one uh, is called uh, The Sun Does Shine. And it's uh, it's the story of Anthony Ray Hinton, who was uh, uh, who was wrongly uh, convicted 
of, uh, of a murder and sent to uh, death row for uh, over 30 years. Uh, he was on death row until, uh, until he was uh, uh, eventually, uh, his conviction was, uh, was reversed and he was set free. But, uh, and, and so to talk, um, to hear him talk about what it's like to, uh, you know, to, ha to have faith as, uh, as he sat in on death row all of these years, all of those years, um, for something he knew he didn't do, you know, and, uh, uh, and to sort of, uh, and, and just to hear his perspective on, on suffering and what, you know, and what that was like, uh, was, um, uh, is, uh, it, it's a really, uh, it's a really good story. So I'd, um, you know, I'd encourage, uh, th those are some, uh, those are some books, um, and on, uh, like I said, sort of stories of people suffering. And then, uh, here's a couple, and then this would be a couple of ones about, uh, about suffering itself. Uh, so we've been talking about this book, um, you know, each week, and it has a uh, it has a chapter on the um, on our question for this week on uh, how does a good God allow uh, allow suffering, uh, and um, uh, and the reason the reason for God by Tim Keller has the same, has a has a chapter on that uh, as uh, as well. Uh, there's um, uh, there's a book uh, the the cross before me by Rankin uh, Wilkin Wilborn. Uh, and uh, the subtitle is "Reimagining the Way to the Good Life," and uh, and we'll I, um, we'll we may mention this a little bit later too. But uh, but this is a really good book. Uh, it was helpful for me in sort of transforming how to think about suffering in terms of something that you know we sort of avoid at all costs <laughs> uh, versus uh, versus something that uh, that God. Uh, that, that may be one of the most powerful ways, the things that God uses to transform us, and uh, and to um, uh, and, and so just uh, his perspective on that was really uh, was really helpful uh, for me. And then uh, and I'll just mention two other ones: uh, "Trusting God" by Jerry Bridges uh, is a book that's been around for a while, but um, uh, but's really good on this uh, on this subject. Uh, Doug, who preached this morning, he works for uh, the Navigators. Uh, his parents were, uh, which is a campus ministry. And uh, uh, and him and his wife both do. His parents uh, did also. They've been um, on staff his, his whole life, so he's pretty connected to them. And Jerry Bridges is from uh, uh, from their ministry, and uh, uh, and is um, is a really good uh, is a really good writer. And then the last one I'll mention is "When Your Rope Breaks" by Steve Brown. Uh, Steve Brown was a um, he was one of my seminary professors, and uh, and he's got a really a really good uh, you know an engaging writing style, but. Um, uh, but he's also, um, uh, I should always appreciate his honesty and how he talks about uh, difficult, uh, you know, difficult subjects and, and how he goes about doing that. So, uh, so, so those are some of the ones that, um, you know, that, I, that I'd recommend. Um, uh, do you guys have any, uh, any books that you've read on, uh, on, on this subject or anything that you, would re that you would recommend that's been helpful for you? I was, was thinking about Max Cleland's book, um, strong in all in broken places okay where he was a double double amputee from vietnam re oh, wow. reaching down and picking up a grenade that he thought we got off a helicopter and yeah. picked up a grenade and went off and uh, severely damaged his legs and wow okay um, went on to some leadership positions here in georgia oh neat so, uh, so tell me the name and the uh, and the author's name one more time. Max Cleland, former Secretary of State of Georgia. Okay. Uh, and I think the title "Strong in the Broken Places." Okay. All right, that's good. I'll have to um I'll, I'll have to check that out for sure. Um, uh, all right. Um, were there um, I, before we jump into um some things, did you uh did anybody have any questions? from the sermon this morning or things that Doug, uh, Doug mentioned or talked about or anything that, uh, that stood out to you from what he, uh, from what he said. I, Doug is beginning his ministry, right? He is. Yeah. He's, right. uh, I, I got a, I enjoyed his tackling the subject. I, I enjoyed that you two turned over the hard topic to the rookie. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We said, uh, you know, what do you want to what what do you want to preach on this summer? And that's what he picked. So <laughs> we okay. said, go for it. <laughs> uh, that's yeah, he made some great points. 
yeah yeah he did he did a um he did a good job um uh, uh yeah he um he's an intern uh yeah it's sort of an internship uh at the at the church um uh it, which is part of the ordination process to um uh, to get uh, to get ordained and so um so yeah preaching sort of a part of that and uh yeah he did I, I agree i think he did a good job um well uh, first i want to just look through um uh look look through a number of different scriptures uh, that talk about suffering i think this is one of those topics that um uh you uh, if you if you read scripture it's pretty clear right that uh that this is uh this is a, a big topic right and it's uh and it's something that scripture doesn't shy away from uh and uh and yet i think there are plenty of uh of churches uh, around that preach something uh you know something very different right in the in the sense of you know teaching that uh you know the gospel is a way to avoid suffering, right? That your uh, that your level of uh, of faith and faithfulness is connected to how little or much you'll uh, you know you'll suffer and uh, and some things like that. And so I think we, uh, as as much as it's in the scriptures, I think it's uh, it, it's very misunderstood from scripture a lot of times. So I thought um, what might be helpful is to just walk through a number of scriptures uh, and just look at them briefly, but uh, but to just give us a you know a wide range of uh, of places that uh that that god teaches us about suffering and uh and helps us to sort of understand that a little bit um uh, and uh and i thought you know just just to start with you know the scriptures that doug looked at in um uh you know in the sermon this morning uh you know romans uh romans 8 um you know really that whole that whole chapter i mean like like we said he did a good job of of walking through some of the, you know, the particulars of, uh, of this chapter to see how, you know, Paul is leading us to an understanding of, uh, of suffering that, uh, uh, that, that's vital to, um, to our faith, right, and to, uh, and, and to growing in, uh, in our faith. I mean, if anybody is going to talk about suffering, right, Paul would be the guy <laughs> to do it. Uh, right. he, uh, you know, I mean, you think about all the things that he uh, that, that he went through, um, you know, shipwrecks being, you know, brought within an inch of his life a number of different times through, uh, uh, you know, through through all sorts of things. And, uh, uh, you know, in the ways that, um, <laughs> that suffering was a pretty regular part of his uh, of his life. You know, it's interesting, even in uh, when, when Paul is first called. Uh, Saul, uh, God appears to, uh, you know, to, uh, to this guy, Cornelius, who, um, uh, uh, who, who Saul is going to go to see. And, you know, he's scared, right? Because, uh, because he knows what Saul's life has been like. And, uh, and God says, you know, uh, Saul's going to come to you and, uh, and I am going to show him how much he's going to suffer for my name. Right. So even, <laughs> um, uh, it's the calling, you know, even from the very beginning of Paul's, uh, uh, life as a believer uh you know god says um he's gonna uh, he's gonna suffer for me and that's not and it's not and in no way is god saying you know paul paul's been a real uh, <laughs> uh he's been a real pain in my side uh for these last few years so i'm gonna re i'm gonna teach him a lesson and i'm gonna show him something right that's not that's not what it is at all it's um uh, there, there's something about the experience of suffering that um that sort of prepares Paul and equips Paul for, uh, for his ability to preach the gospel and to write the, um, the things that he, uh, that he does and to be used, uh, and to be used by God. And so, um, uh, you know, and so, and so a, a chapter like, uh, Romans eight, where, you know, where Paul is talking about suffering is not from, uh, from sort of this disconnected place of, uh, you know, let me, um, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've read a lot about this in books, so let me tell you <laughs> what, um, uh, what this is like, you know, it's from a, it's from a real experience of, uh, of suffering. And so I think that's helpful for us to, um, uh, to, you know, to think about, uh, you know, as he, as he talks about, you know, even the, um, you know, the weakness that comes in suffering and, uh, and how God sustains us in, uh, in, in that weakness, 
Uh, I think he speaks from a place of experience to say, uh, you know, I've, I've seen this, I've, I've experienced this. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, when we're, th when, when we're thinking about uh, suffering or when we're talking about, uh, you know, this, um, this issue with, uh, you know, with other people, maybe people who aren't believers, I think Romans 8 is a good place to, uh, is a good place to go and a good place to start to, uh, to, to be able to look at this. Um, uh, and then, you know, in Job, uh, in, in Job 42, I think, uh, you know, just the, uh, when, when Job says, you know, I've heard of you with my ears, but now I've seen, you know, now I've seen you, I've seen you face to face, I've, I've experienced you. Um, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a real, um, uh, there's a real power there, right, to say, uh, as, you know, Doug, Doug emphasized it this morning, I mean, Job was a righteous man, right? He, uh, he knew God, he walked with God, he, he followed God, and yet, uh, at, the at the end of, um, of this experience, Job looks back and he says, as righteous as I was, as, uh, you know, as, as closely as I was following you, uh, I, I wasn't even close to knowing you the way that I know you now, right? The, um, and to understanding uh, who you are and what you're like, uh, um, like, uh, like, I, like I do now. And so uh, I think that's, um, uh, you know, that's an, it's important for us uh, as we uh, as we think about our own suffering, you know, to um, uh, uh, to ask, you know, in the um, uh, uh, you know, God, what um, what am I? What are you wanting me to learn about you that uh, that I couldn't have or wouldn't have learned through any through anything else? And that's a hard question to ask sometimes. You know, I know I think about you know, some of the things that I've gone, you know, I've gone through, you know, in my life, um, you know, losing jobs and, um, uh, you know, Kelly, Kelly going through a miscarriage, you know, different, different things that we, that we've had. And, um, uh, you know, that as we think, uh, as we think about our own suffering, but then to look back and to say, you know, I don't know, I don't know why these things have happened necessarily. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have any, I don't have any answers for, for that. Um, but what is it about God that I experienced in those moments and in those uh, and in those times that um, you know, like I said, that I wouldn't have or couldn't have learned uh, any other way, uh, any other way? And I and I and I do think I've I've found that. You know, it's um, as much as we you know, as much as we want to uh, you know avoid suffering and uh, and that sort of thing at times. Um, the I don't know that I've ever felt closer to God than coming out of some of those times of, uh, you know, of, of suffering and, and hardships. And so, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't, it, it's not to say it's, it's pleasant in the moment, right. And, uh, uh, and that we enjoy it in the, in the moment. And yet, uh, and, and yet I think I've experienced for myself, you know, this, uh, this sense that um, I don't know that I would have known God in some of the ways that I've, that I've, come to experience him and know him and see him work uh, outside of, uh, of suffering, outside of, uh, you know, coming to a place where I realize I'm completely out of control, uh, that, um, that I can't make it better, right? And yet, uh, and yet experience God's presence and his faithfulness uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the midst of it anyhow. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, for uh, when Job talks about that, I think, um, you know, I think it's really, uh, it, it's really powerful too, because I, I mean, you know, we, uh, most of us read the story of Job and think, man, I don't know that I could come up with a scenario <laughs> where more bad things happen, right? And, and, uh, uh, and yet, um, uh, and, and yet he's able, um, uh, you know, like we said, to, to come out on the other side of it with an experience of, uh, uh, of God like that. Um, uh, first, uh, first Peter chapter one, uh, this is what I did the children's message on this morning. And, uh, uh, and I think, uh, I, I think it's a helpful, uh, you know, it's a, it, it's an important passage when we think about suffering also. Um, uh, you know, it, I'll read it again. It says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, 
that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, so there's this, um, uh, you know, there's this testing of our faith and this refining of, uh, of our faith and our character uh, that, um, uh, uh, that God uses suffering to, uh, uh, to, bring, uh, to bring about in our lives. Um, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, uh, who wrote that book, When God, uh, when God Weeps, she, uh, she has this line in the book where she says, uh, um, uh, sometimes God uh, allows what he hates uh, to, um, uh, what is it, uh, to accomplish what he loves. Right. Uh, sometimes he allows what he hates to accomplish what he loves. And, uh, you know, and I and, and, you know, and for her, she would say that she has seen that in her life. Right. That that he um, uh, that he hates uh, the, um, uh, you know, the suffering that she's experienced through her accident and, and, and those sorts of things uh, and, and sort of the brokenness of her body. And yet uh, and yet he's accomplishing uh, something in her that uh uh that he that he longs for all of us right and it's uh and it's through that uh through that suffering through that refining of uh of the of the temptation or not the temptations but the you know the tribulations and the trials that we uh that we go through and uh uh you know i think uh that's uh, ever since I've, i read that book that um you know that line sticks with me that he you know he allows what he hates to accomplish what uh, uh, what he loves, um, and uh, you know, <laughs> like Doug said, you know, this morning um, to get to get to that perspective, uh, you know, is uh, is a work of God's grace in itself, right? Because uh, uh, because when we when we're in the midst of it, a lot of times we're not saying, God, thank you for allowing this thing to happen to accomplish what you love, right? That's right. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so, uh, and so it's um, even, you know, our, our ability to, to see that perspective and to begin to believe it is, is a work of God's, you know, of God's grace. And, uh, uh, you know, and so when Paul says, while he's suffering himself, uh, you know, your, your grace is sufficient for me, right? I think this is, this is part of what, uh, what he's talking about, right? Not just, uh, uh not just the ability to sort of walk through what he's going through, but, uh, but the ability to trust God in, uh, in, in the midst of it. It really is, uh, it really is a, a gift. Um, I uh, remember hearing, uh, hearing someone talk about suffering one time and, you know, and they talked about how uh, a lot of times we look at other people's sufferings and we think, uh, Man, I never, uh, I would never be able to handle that. I don't know what I would do if that ever happened uh, to me, you know. Um, and uh, and, but what they were saying is that often what we don't realize is that those people had they, you know, before they encountered those uh, those trials, they would have thought the same exact thing, right? And yet, uh, and yet, once they uh, once they were in the midst of it that's when they experience God's grace in, uh, uh, to, to help them in the midst of it. And so, and so a lot of times, uh, you know, we, uh, God is giving us the grace to, uh, uh, to, to be able to walk through today, right? And, uh, uh, and, and sometimes we uh, feel ill-prepared for what, for what we're going to encounter tomorrow. And yet, when we get to tomorrow, God's going to give, give us the... Um, uh, the the grace to be able to uh, uh, to walk through uh, to walk through that and that was that was encouraging for for me um, uh, just to think about uh, um, you know how faithful God is uh, in in those moments right that um, uh, that when they when they come uh, we uh, we see His presence and we see His uh, uh, His uh, His faithfulness in the uh, in the midst of it and so He's uh, and, 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 you know, and that's part of why it brings him such, uh, such glory in, uh, uh, in our suffering. Um, do you guys have a couple of other scriptures? Do you guys, do you guys have any scriptures that have been helpful for you, um, uh, over, uh, over the years, maybe in the, in the midst of, you know, difficult things that you've gone through? 
one of my favorite that usually pops into my mind right away is what Jesus said on the cross in his suffering, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah. I find that incredibly comforting. It doesn't sound like it should be. Right. But to understand that Jesus himself uh, entered this life and at a level to submit himself to the to a pain that's indescribable on the cross. And to, to say that means that here is our Christ saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which is often asked. I mean, it's just a variation of the question. Why would a good God allow this to happen? Yeah. And that, that, I, that I think it's a faith statement to be able to call on God in such a way that our agony is flowing through. Mm -hmm. So I find that, a, a, for me, a very significant verse. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, um, I agree. I mean, we, we have all felt the same at times, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, to hear Jesus actually express what, what, we've, all, what we've all felt is, yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, um, I really like uh, in Psalm 34, um, where it says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Like, I like that it's present tense and not like he will be there when you're brokenhearted. It's like, he's already there. Like yeah. you don't have to ask him. Yeah. You don't have to wait till you are brokenhearted and ask him to be there. Like he knows when you're going to be there or be brokenhearted and he's already there. And it's like, it's just, it's, it's almost like a statement of fact. Like it's not, so and it's very plain and simple. And yeah, I just, I really like that one. Yeah, that's, um, that's good. And I think that's, I think that's one of those great verses uh, to, um, uh, you know, to, to respond with, uh, for people who would say that, you know, like we were saying before, like that you're suffering, you know, when you suffer, it's because um, you haven't been faithful enough or it's God punishing you, you know, or, or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. If you just have enough faith, uh, you know, then you won't, then you won't suffer. And I think, yeah, I think that's one of those verses where it's like, no, God, God's in the midst of our, uh, of our suffering and he's, uh, and mm -hmm. he's, he's present there. It's not, our suffering isn't the absence of God. <laughs> um, right. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I think you're right. That's a, that's a good one. Um, we uh, were looking at different psalms for our student ministry small groups this uh, this summer, and we did Psalm uh, uh, we did Psalm sixty three this uh, this week, and, uh, and and that's always uh, that's always been a, um, a a helpful one I think um, you know because uh, uh, for me because it's David writing uh, you know while he's in the wilderness right while while he's in the middle of running for his life he's being chased down. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and then, and yet in the, in the midst of it, you know, he says, Oh God, uh, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. Uh, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you is in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live in your name. I will lift up my hands. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and as the psalm goes on, David never, he doesn't ask for anything. <laughs> um, uh, you know, he doesn't ask for God to uh, deliver him or take these things away or, or any of those things. You know, and, and so there's this sense in which uh, in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of these things that he's going through, he realizes even if all those things were taken away and he didn't have God, uh, he would, um, uh, he, he would still be, uh, he would still be in trouble. Uh, but, um, if those things continue, but he has, but he has God, uh, then, um, uh, then he has everything that he, uh, uh, that he needs. And so, um, uh, and so I just think that's, um, uh, it's a great picture from, uh, from David of, uh, uh of how to call out to God, you know, sort of in the, uh, in the midst of suffering sometimes, um, uh, John 11 is a uh, is a good one, uh, you know, where Jesus um, goes to the tomb of Lazarus, and uh, 
you know, I think, I mean, I, we could talk about this story for, <laughs> for a really long, uh, a really long time, you know, but, uh, uh, but there's some, there's some things that are really interesting about it. You know, Mary and Martha, uh, they send word uh, to, uh, to Jesus that, um, that their brother Lazarus is, uh, is sick. And, uh, and, what is, uh, and what does Jesus do? He, he stays where he's at another couple of days. And, uh, and, and it's, um, it, it's always interesting to me that, um, uh, that Jesus didn't, uh, he didn't have a problem with allowing that suffering to, uh, uh, to, to continue. Uh, and uh, because there was a greater purpose uh, in, uh, in mind for it. And so, you know, so Jesus, you know, in one sense, he knew what was going to happen, right? He knew that Lazarus was going to die. He knew that he was going to bring Lazarus back from the dead. Um, and so, uh, and so he, he waited. And this isn't something that, you know, um, Mary and Martha knew, right? And so when Jesus finally gets there, you know, they're like, Jesus, where were you? Why didn't, why didn't you come? Why did you leave us? Uh, why did you leave us alone? If you would have come, our, uh, our brother would have been, uh, would have been okay. Right. And, uh, and a lot of times I think, you know, because we, um, because we don't have the perspective that, that God does, our questions surround are sort of are surround God, if you would have been here and done what I wanted you to do, things would have been better, right? And, uh, and, and we speak from this place of um, thinking we have all the information, but not having nearly enough information. And so, uh, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, Mary and, uh, and Martha are doing the same thing. They're, they're speaking with faith, right? I mean, they're saying, Jesus, we know you could have healed him. We know you can do something even, uh, even now. Uh, and, yet, um, and yet they have no idea uh, the, uh, the, the things that God, that Jesus is about to do, the glory that he's going to bring to himself and what he's going to accomplish through, uh, through their suffering. Um, and yet, you know, and so, and so having said all of that, Jesus knowing all, all of this, uh, what, ha what happens right in the middle of this story, right? It's, it's the verse everybody loves to memorize because it's so short, right? <laughs> Jesus weeps, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, uh, and and so, you know, you have uh, you have this incredible picture of a savior who uh, who knows you know, who knows what's going to happen, right? Who has the power to um, to heal, the power to do whatever he wants, and yet he allows certain things to happen, uh, and and even knowing the good that's going to come out of them, he. Uh, he weeps for people that he cares about, right? He, uh, he weeps over uh, the, uh, the brokenness and the sadness of, uh, of, of, our, of our world, um, it, even though he knows he's going to fix it, right? Even though he knows he's going to uh, put it back together, uh, there, he's, not without, um, he's not without compassion, right? He's, uh, uh, he's not without uh, uh, sort of a feeling and an understanding of what it is that we're, uh, that we're going through. And I think that's... Um, uh, it's so helpful uh, for us as we uh, as we follow Jesus to know that He is not um, He's not distant from uh, from our suffering, and that He He weeps with us. That He um, uh, that He feel you know He He feels He knows what it's like, um, and uh, uh, and yet He can have a, a love for us and a compassion for us in the midst of our suffering, but also continue. To do what he knows is best, uh, to accomplish what he wants in us, and to accomplish what he wants, sort of for his glory and his kingdom uh, through uh, through us um, as uh, as well. And so, uh, you know, so, uh, so I think John, um, you know, John eleven with uh, with Jesus and Lazarus is a great one. Um, uh, there were a couple uh, of other ones uh, I was going to look at really uh, really quickly. Um, oh, in Romans uh, in Romans five. Uh, you know, Paul talking again about suffering, and he says, um, uh, let's see, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 
And so we have, um, you know, so we have some, some specific tangible things that God, uh, that, that God says he's, he's building in us and uh, he's shaping in us through, uh, uh, through our suffering, right? Uh, endurance, uh, character, hope, right? These are, um, uh, these are things that, uh, that we really learn to appreciate and, uh, and, and to anchor our faith in uh, when we're going through, uh, when we're going through suffering. Um, you know, there's, uh, I, Doug mentioned this uh, briefly this morning, but, you know, sometimes uh, where this question will sort of lead is, well, why did, why did God allow uh, Adam and Eve to sin in the first place, right? You know, it's like, why, uh, why, wh what was the point of, um, uh, of that and, and allowing that to happen? And, uh, and, and I think there is something uh, about suffering that God is doing in this world. Uh, there's something about, uh, you know, redemption of sin and brokenness and all of these things in our world that is leading to something uh, even greater than if, uh, than if sin had never come, in, uh, come into the world in the garden. You know, and so in a sense, the Bible is not, you know, the, the story of the Bible is not leading us somehow to return back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, it's leading us to uh, something that's even better than the, than the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, it's, um, uh, it's this fuller um, uh, it, understanding of who God is and this fuller picture of, uh, of what God uh, is like that we will, uh, that we will get, to, uh, get to experience. And so, uh, and so there is something that God produces through suffering in us right, in our character, in our hope, uh, and in our endurance, um, and there's something that God is producing uh, through, um, uh, through the, the suffering of our, of, of our world, right, the groaning pains of, uh, of our world, like we talked about this morning, uh, that, um, uh, that is leading us to something even, uh, even, even better than we could have, uh, we could have imagined. Uh, you know, in uh, in the book of Hebrews, um, there's there's some interesting things that uh, you know that he that the author of Hebrews mentions about Jesus and his uh, and his suffering. Uh, in Hebrews chapter two, verses nine and ten, it says, "But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone." And then it says, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Right? Isn't that, um, uh, isn't that interesting that he says um, uh, that he's crowned with glory and honor because of, uh, of his suffering? Right? That there's, that there's something about, uh, uh, about Jesus' experience of suffering uh, and his... Uh, the, his humbling of himself, right, even to death on a cross, uh, that uh, that produces uh, a, a glory that uh, that he never would have been able to experience, uh, uh, you know, otherwise. And um, uh, you know, and even it says uh, that Jesus uh, was made perfect through suffering, right? There was there was something about uh, about suffering that even. Uh, um, uh, that that even made his experience of being human <laughs> uh, complete, right? And, uh, and and I think there's there's something, uh, you know, if if it says that Jesus was made perfect through suffering, how much more uh, is there a perfection that God is doing is is working us towards through uh, uh, through through suffering? Uh, and so I think, um, uh, you know, and so I think that's. Uh, you know, I think that's important. And then in verse, uh, uh, in, in uh, chapter five, verse eight of Hebrews, it says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what, uh, through what he suffered. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and so again, Jesus, uh, you know, if, uh, if Jesus was a, if suffering was a part of, uh, of what it meant for Jesus to walk on this earth, to be fully human, Right, uh, and uh, then there's then there's something about suffering uh, for us uh, that uh, that makes us human, but also accomplishes what it is God's uh, wanting to uh, wanting to accomplish, which is really uh, you know which is really hopeful.
uh, for us. Uh, and then the last passage I was going to remember, I was going to mention is, uh, is in James chapter one. Uh, and it says, uh, starting in verse two, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Um, so, uh, uh, so, you know, James says, uh, count it all joys, uh, count it all joy as you, uh, as you, as you suffer. Um, and, uh, you know, like we said before, this is not usually our first response to suffering, right? Is to, uh, is to count it as joy and to, uh, and to rejoice in it. And yet, um, uh, and yet there's something that it's producing uh, in the testing of our faith and in the endurance that, uh, that God gives us, uh, that, um, uh, that gives a gives a purpose to our suffering um, that uh, uh, that helps us to uh, to understand suffering better and how God uh, and how God could uh, could allow it. Um, yeah. So uh, so those are those are you know some verses that I think uh, you know when we. When we think about well, what does the Bible really have to say about suffering, right? What does God really have to uh, have to say about something? It's um, it's more than just uh, something to be avoided. It's more than just you know, it's it, there's more to uh, to the experience of suffering than just um, denying it. Also, right? Some some people would say, well, the way to respond to suffering is just to pretend like it doesn't exist, right? Or uh, uh, you know, there's um, there, there's other religions and philosophies that that's that that's how they deal with the with the problem of, of suffering, right? Is to just say, uh, you know, we'll just pretend like it's not there. And uh, and really, what it means to, you know, sort of achieve the good life and and, and live the live the good life is uh, is the ability to sort of uh, avoid suffering at all costs and to, and to put it and to put it away from you. And when you do suffer, to pretend like it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, like it doesn't exist. Uh, and yet. I do you think when we when you talk to people who have suffered, uh, when you talk to people who have gone through really uh, um, you know really difficult things, uh, you know, it's why I was saying before the importance of you know reading books and, and talking to people who have who have been through those kinds of things. I think you often find that um, uh, there there's something about uh there, there's something about their suffering that uh that they're thankful for right that they're uh, that they're grateful for uh because of because of what it's produced uh, as a result you know there's a um you know understanding that there's purpose in our suffering doesn't mean we understand like the why question of our suffering right there's nowhere in the bible that promises that um you know what it what it means to endure suffering is for God to tell you, uh, you know, this is these are the four reasons why this happened, right? There's certain things that I can look at in my life and I can say, uh, you know, I I went I went through this, um, you know, like uh, I've talked about this before, like lo you know, losing losing my job, for example, at the last place that uh, at the last church that I worked at. There are certain things that I can look at 11 years later, right? At, and being and being here at Faith for 11 years, that I can say. Uh, all right, I can see that God has taught me some things through this process uh, that I would not have learned otherwise. And I've gotten to experience some really incredible blessings being here that I, that I would have, you know, I wouldn't have had, right. I would have, I would have missed out on had, I had no other choice, but to, <laughs> but, but to leave the last place and, and come here. Right. Uh, and, and yet there are also things about it that I won't, um, uh, you know that that were really difficult, and that I won't understand why, right? And that I won't understand why God could not have done it a different way that was less painful or less <laughs> uh, or, or less difficult uh, as we uh, as we as we went through it. And yet, I think that's some of the point, right? If um, uh, if there was always an easier way, uh, if we always chose the easier way, um, it wouldn't produce what <laughs> what suffering produces. And so and so God. Uh, God allows these things into our lives. He allows us to experience these uh, these times of, of suffering because He knows it's going to produce something we would never experience if He always let us choose 
uh, to, uh, to, to avoid it. And so, uh, you know, and, and so I think, you know, per purpose and suffering, I think is a, uh, you know, while, while it doesn't give us the answer of why we're going through it, it gives us the hope that it's not wasted, right? And that, um, uh, and that God uh, is able to use all of our suffering uh, for uh, uh, for his for his purposes, even if we don't see what those uh, what those purposes are. Um, uh, so there, um, uh, oh, there was an interesting um, quote in uh, in one of these books uh, in confronting Christianity on page uh, was it one ninety seven here. She says. Uh, she's talking about how um, she's been talking about different approaches to, to suffering uh, that different philosophies and different religions take, and uh, and so sort of at the at the end of uh, at the end of this, she says perhaps the key to facing suffering is not detachment and not uh, and removal, but meaning and love. Non-attachment may shield us from suffering. To love is to be vulnerable. To desire and strive is to risk disappointment. Uh, but non-attachment also deprives us of our greatest joys. Striving, desire, and deep attachment can lead us to the precipice, but they can also bring us to treasures uh, non-attachment cannot find. Right, and so there, um, and so there's there's certain things that uh, that we just can't find and can't experience apart from uh, uh, apart from suffering. If you saw, I don't know if you saw the movie um, Inside Out. Uh, it was a um, a Disney uh, movie, and it's you know it's about these emotions where uh, where it's sort of inside the brain of this uh, of this um, teenage girl, and uh, uh, you know which <laughs> I have a teenage girl. It's a scary thought, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, and and the whole point is to show sort of how uh, you know how emotions work together, and you know the the emotion of joy is wanting you know, her to just be joyful all the time, no matter what, right? To do whatever it takes to make sure she's joyful and happy all the time. Uh, and, um, uh, and you know, sadness is always sort of creeping in uh, through, uh, throughout the movie. And by the end of the movie, uh, you know, part of the point of the movie is to show how uh, she, the, the girl never would have experienced the greatest joys that she experienced had she not been through uh, the sadness of uh, of disappointment and failure and things that she had experienced along along the way as well, and that uh, you know and that and that joy and sadness actually work together uh, to um, uh, to produce something that they can't produce you know sort of apart from each other and on their own and uh, and so um, you know I give I give Disney movies a hard time sometimes but uh, uh, but they but they did a good job in uh, in that one I thought uh, uh, it, it was a really good uh, it was a really good point. Um, and uh, you know, and so let's see what else. Uh, what else I have here? Oh, you know, suffering. Um, you know, like we said, suffering is a means to something. Uh, to something better, right? It's uh, that God is uh, that God is doing, and uh, you know, and one of the thing one of the things that's better is um, is that it teaches us to uh, how to walk with Him and how to and how to follow Him. Uh, there's a movie that came out last year called A Hidden Life, and it's about. Um, uh, it's a true story about this Austrian farmer uh, during the uh, the rise of uh, Hitler and uh, and the Nazis in Germany, and uh, you know and and uh, Austrians were uh, were all you know sort of conscripted to fight uh, in uh, in the army for for Hitler, and so uh, and so eventually he uh, he decides uh, when he's called to um, uh, to to not take the um, the oath. Uh, to Hitler and do, and he and is thrown in uh, in prison as a result and uh, and suffers as a result because he can't figure out how his faith uh, would allow him uh, to um, uh, uh, to to do what he's being asked to do in uh, in this thing and so uh, you know and and so it's it's a really great uh, great movie and at one point before he uh, before he goes to jail you know he's he's really wrestling with what's he going to do when this happens and he and he walks up to his church. And there's a guy painting, uh, uh, painting in the uh, in, in the church, um, all these different you know murals on the on the walls. And this guy is kind of sent from church to church to to paint different scenes from Jesus's life and, and things like that on the walls. And they're having this conversation, and uh, and the painter is talking about how uh, they they rarely ask him to paint pictures of Jesus uh, 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 from Jesus's life of suffering. 
right? He's like, they're always asking me to paint the happy pictures, right? The miracles, the, uh, you know, the, the, the things, um, uh, the, you know, these, uh, these really positive things. And they, and they rarely uh, ask me to paint anything uh, that portrays uh, suffering and, uh, you know, and, and hardship. And, uh, and he has this line where he says, uh, you know, we're, we're creating admirers, uh, but we're not creating followers uh, in, uh, in the church. And, uh, you know, and I think, um, and, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, that, that suffering does is it, uh, it produces an ability to, to follow uh, Jesus, to, um, you know, to deny ourselves, you know, like we talked about last week a little bit, uh, for the sake of, uh, of, of following Jesus. It, it really does test our faith, like, you know, like we read in a couple of those different, uh, uh, different passages. And apart from suffering, apart from uh, understanding how the necessity of suffering and how, and how it works in our lives, uh, we um, were sort of along uh, for, for the ride for all the good things that Jesus promises and, uh, um, and, and, and is offering. And, um, and we're not really following him uh, for, uh, uh, for the sake of giving up our lives for, uh, uh, for, um, for him. Um, the other thing that I think it uh, produces is, uh, you know, for uh, for all the um, you know for all the places in in church history where we could look and say, uh, you know, the the church blew it, right, or, or Christians uh, made mistakes, and we'll talk about some of those over the next few uh, weeks as well, and some of these different uh, some of these different topics. Um, there, there's also uh, it, it's undeniable to look through church history and. Uh, and, and not see all the places where Christians have been at the center of uh, of relieving the suffering of the world, right? And uh, uh, and of uh, and of impacting the places uh, that have been most uh, uh, you know <laughs> decimated by by sin and a brokenness and uh, you know and, and suffering. We see it, you know, in the uh, in the medical field. We see it in serving the poor. We see it in uh, you know all of these different uh, all of these different places throughout history and around the world where Christians and the church are at the forefront of uh, of entering into uh, uh, suffering and uh, and and working to comfort people and relieve uh, uh, people's suffering even often while taking that suffering on for themselves right uh, we might have mentioned this in one of the other weeks right even in the early church when diseases hit cities everyone who had money disappeared right uh, they all they all went uh, as far as they could from the city until the disease was gone. Uh, and people who didn't have money, people who had been affected by the disease, were left there to, to suffer and to die, often alone, without their family, without anybody. And the church, Christians, are the ones that would stay, even at the risk of contracting diseases for themselves and dying, so that they could comfort people uh, in, uh, in their suffering, so that they could uh, treat people and even, uh, and even hold people's hands while they, uh, while, while they died in the midst of that suffering. And, and so, you know, there's something about, uh, uh, about worshiping a savior who suffered for us, right? That compels us uh, to, uh, to enter into the suffering of other people, right? I mean, that's the whole story of the gospel, right? Is that, is that Jesus uh, willingly left heaven, right? To enter into uh, uh, everything that's wrong with this world and take it on himself and experience it on himself. Uh, it, to, to rescue us, right? To, um, uh, uh, to, to save us from it and ultimately uh, to, uh, to fix it and to make it right. And so, uh, and so this, is the, this is the compelling thing that, that drives uh, believers as, uh, as well, right? To, to have a savior like that and to say uh, what, it, what it means to look more like Jesus is to enter into people's suffering also uh, and, uh, and to take what uh, Jesus is teaching me in suffering and to be able to sit with others who are suffering and uh, and walk with them through it, uh, through it as well, uh, and so uh, you know, and, and so our experience of suffering gives us uh, gives us incredible tools for uh, uh, for uh, following Jesus, right? No matter uh, no matter what, and uh, and then for uh, for entering into the suffering of uh, of others as uh, uh, as well. Um, The only other, the only other thing I'll, uh, I'll mention, and then uh, if you guys have any other questions, we can talk about it, and then, uh, and then wrap up. Um, you know, there, uh, 
there's an important distinction to make between, uh, you know, in, in the same way that there's sort of two different categories of books, right? Of uh, books of people who are walking through suffering and understanding what that's like for them, and then a sort of theology of suffering. Uh, there's um, there's a difference for us too in helping people understand a theology of suffering and uh, and walking with people who are actually suffering, right? Um, uh, you know, they're uh, often, uh, you know, when we um, when we come alongside people who are suffering, uh, the first maybe our first tem our, our temptation of what we want to do is sort of say is to give them lots of answers, right? For this is what the Bible says, and this is what uh, you know, and um, uh, and you know, don't feel so bad. This is uh, you know, this is um, everything's going to be fine. Uh, everything works out for a reason, and and that sort of thing, and. And those things are those things are really they're true, right? And they're important for us to understand. I think that's a good reason why it's important for us to build a foundation of what we believe about suffering before we're <laughs> um, we're suffering and when we're not in suffering, because it's what anchors us when we do actually go through those things. Uh, but um, but it's also important for us to uh, you know to to weep with those who weep, right? To grieve with those who uh, who grieve, like Romans twelve. Uh, call, calls us to, and uh, and to understand that there's an important um, uh, that there's an important part of how God uses us in the lives of others who are suffering. Uh, that's not just information based, right? That's not just uh, they need they need the answers, and so we're going to bring them to them. That may be a, a part of that process, but often that's not what we lead with, right? It's not um, uh, we uh, often we um, you know we lead with. Uh, uh, you know, listening and crying with them and, you know, weeping with them and grieving with them and praying with and for them uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and and just sitting with them and uh, uh, in the midst of it. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard people say, uh, you know, with Job, uh, you know, the uh, the best thing Job's friends did was sit and say nothing, right? <laughs> it was when they opened their mouths that they really blew it. And, uh, uh, you know, and I, and I think uh, I think that can be, just a helpful reminder for us too at times when, you know, uh, as we, as we enter into the suffering of other people to, um, uh, you know, to sit first and to listen first and to, uh, and to comfort first. And, uh, you know, and then, um, when, you know, when the opportunity is, uh, is there, uh, to be able to help them understand the truths about why, you know, why we believe what we believe about, about God also, because they'll ask those questions, right? I mean, anyone who's suffering is going to come to the, is going to come to ask those questions and, and answer them. But, uh, but often they're going to answer, ask them of the people who, uh, uh, who they know have loved them well in the midst of their suffering and when they were struggling uh, and when they were struggling the most. And so, um, and so often it, it provides an opportunity for us to be able to do that down, uh, down the road. Um, and, uh, uh, Let's see what else we have here. Um, oh, and then, uh, well, yeah, the only other thing, uh, and then the other thing I'll say is, uh, I, I also think we have a lot to learn about suffering from uh, the, maybe the, the church in the West has a lot to learn about suffering from, uh, uh, from the church around the world uh, that has often suffered uh, much, uh, much more than we have, particularly for their, for their faith. Uh, you know, and it, and it's not to say that to minimize you know the suffering that we go through, and uh, but um, uh, but there's there's something that uh, you know the uh, the global church has experienced in places uh, you know in places like China and places uh, uh, you know in the Middle East uh, where um, uh, where we um, we should do probably a lot more listening than we do to uh, uh, to to what they have to say about what it means to follow Jesus in the face of uh, in the in the face of suffering and uh, and so um, a lot of times it's easy for us to sort of distance ourselves from from that or uh, uh, you know because they're so far away uh, and um, and yet there's something I think uh, I think they they have to to offer uh, the church in the West and to and to teach us that um, uh, that's in real that's really important for us to. Uh, uh, to, to listen, um, particularly about suffering for, uh, for your faith. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think the, uh, you know, as we sort of struggle to figure out how do we move forward with the, um, you know, with the racial tension and, and in our country right now and the things that we feel, I think, 
I think there's a lot that white evangelical churches have to learn from the African American church about about suffering too, and about walking with God through uh, uh, through suffering. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, there there is a sense in which you know for for us uh, a, a, as the church we feel like uh, as Christians we're being more and more you know marginalized that it's harder to be a Christian. Uh, uh, you know, um, today and, the, and with the challenges that we face and, uh, um, and the opposition maybe and, the, and you know, and the suffering that that, uh, that that creates. And I think even in our own country, the African-American church has experienced that a lot longer than, uh, than we have and, uh, and, has, uh, and has walked through that uh, in a way that has, um, uh, that has produced great faith, right, in, um, uh, in them and something that we can learn from too. You know, I mean, I think just about like the, uh, uh, the Emanuel AME Church in uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. You know, from five or six years ago, when the um uh, when the shooting happened there, and the, and the Dylan Roof came in and and killed you know nine or ten uh, people in the middle of a Bible study there, and and their ability to uh, to forgive uh, you know in the courtroom uh, someone who had killed their family and their friends and their you know and their church members uh, while they worshipped uh, is uh, is something that um you know that's important for us to see and to understand and to, and to learn from. And I think, you know, and I, and I think there's, um, uh, there's a lot that we can learn from, uh, uh, from them as well. So, uh, so I think that's about all, uh, all I have. Do you guys have any other questions or any other, uh, any other thoughts? I think, um, I don't remember when pastor Nathan said it, but I thought it was a good thing to think about. I think it was maybe when like, quarantine was first starting and like the church wasn't doing physical meetings. Um, so I remember watching it on YouTube. And so, and he said that, you know, one thing that we've never as Christians in the United States or, or in this part of the world, we've never had to not gather to worship or we've never been told we can't, you yeah, know, yeah and we don't know what it's like um to be to be in our own community and to be separated from our 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 christian community you know physically like this and so but that that's some that's normal life you know for a lot of uh churches on the other side of the world is that it's illegal essentially for them to gather and to worship and um yeah, so I just thought it was interesting perspective to like, it kind of puts us in, in their shoes in a tiny, tiny way. And I don't know, when, when he said that, I was like, hmm, I didn't really ever consider that. Like, I mean, obviously there's a lot of things that, that we can be learning from this entire 2020 so far, but, um, <laughs> That, yeah, that was one thing that just from like a Christian community perspective that just had not thought about. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, good. Yeah, it's, it's, that's true. It's, we've come really that close to, to it being illegal to worship. I mean, that, that, that's, we got a, a glimpse of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to be denied the right to, uh, to worship. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Any other uh, any other closing uh, closing thoughts? Uh, let me take just a minute to share this. It's, yeah. it's um, I was doing clinical pastoral education at the Emory University System in the Rehabilitation Center. We had a Episcopalian priest who had the worst case of arthritis I'd ever seen. I mean, this they, he could they couldn't take him out of his bed. Uh, he had his, I don't know if you all have ever seen the cases where people's hands were turned to the side mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. severe author. You don't see that very much anymore, but yep. I right. saw it as a young person a lot. The medication has prevented that, but this guy had that and severe, severe pain. And when they took him down for physical therapy, they couldn't even take him out of the bed, put him on a gurney to take him down. They had to take him down in his bed to offer him physical therapy. That's how bad the pain was. 
and I remember we had this um, gathering, um, uh, debriefing with the professionals, and we talked about his case. And I, I remember asking him, why, why did you do that? It's not doing any good. Right. There's no way this guy's going to recover. Mm -hmm. And one of the physical therapists gave me something that stayed with me. To, and I think it's a, it applies to faith very well. She said, in those moments that we've worked on him, they were the best moments of his life, mm -hmm. of his day. And that's faith. Yeah. Is we may be in the midst of suffering. And hopefully none of us will get that level. Jesus certainly had it on the cross, severe, severe suffering. And hopefully we'll never have to go through that. But to have faith, I think, is a step up that we cannot really comprehend just how valuable it is. And those that do have suffering and have faith in the midst do have a sense of how valuable it is. Those of us who have not don't quite get it. Yeah, yeah. There's they, a relief that comes in the yeah, midst of it. Yeah. Where people ask the question, they they dismiss the impact of faith of raising the person's experience to a higher level. What would it be like if they didn't have faith at all? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um... Um, all right well uh well thank you guys very much it was good uh it was good to see you um good to uh good to chat with you guys and uh and we'll see you next week all right thank Thanks. you Dan. all right have a good night good night